He's the type of guy to ask you to please respond <laughs> after an awkward silence. Please clap. Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily cringe content anywhere on the internet. Promise swearsies, it's just a fact and it's totally science. Go ahead and look it up. Today we are jumping into r slash neckbeard stories and I have some very exciting news. User Ramtide has indeed returned as he promised that he would, the prodigal son. So I said I was going to get to Bowler Beard today, but that was yesterday before this post went up. So sorry, a rock stores hang in there tight. We're going to get to it eventually, but uh, age before beauty or something like that. Ram Tide, my boy, where have you been living in your truck? <laughs> but as always, he's come back with some wonderful neck beard tales to tell us, and I am quite looking forward to it. This is a prelude, so I guess it's going to be another saga, which I I'm always looking forward to those. Dems is delicious, especially the Ram Tide ones. So well written, just mwah, beautiful. So, we're going to get some plugs and disclaimers out of the way, the thing that we do, and then we will dive right into some Ramtide branded neckbeard cringe. Prelude! Howdy, neighbor! Oh no, we can't bring back the, uh, <laughs> the sling blade voice. We did it all day yesterday. So just, hey, howdy, neighbor! Rem tidings, dear friends! It is I, your dutiful lord and master, the eternal GM. It has been many a moon and mile since we last convened here together, and I apologize, as always, for my protracted leave of absence. As of this moment, however, I found myself in a lull between my real-world duties, and with this free time on my hands, I've decided to commit once more to the page another turn! from the tabletop for your listening pleasure boy howdy did i miss you red x nerds <laughs> this one i lovingly subtitle kurt mcgurk's butt gets hurt <laughs> uh, uh, you should have been a rapper ram tie you should get some face tattoos oh wait he has face tattoos <laughs> Uh, this story takes place in the highlands of north central New Mexico. After many years on the road, fortune would have it that some friends of mine had a couch whereupon I could rest my weary head. Tired of the road and the backpacker's life, I took them up on the offer and made my way there by the I-40 from Flagstaff due east. I eventually arrived upon their doorstep and settled into the domicile that I would call my home until Further notice. Probably eviction notice. Nah, Ramtide's cool. He'll leave if you tell him to leave. <laughs> uh, I was not the only middle-aged man-child in that apartment. No, my friends were also giant nerds. Their usual game of choice was magic, and this was all well and good. I'd play cards with them, watch their animes, read their comics, but it was all lackluster to the hobby of hobbies that always lurked as an itch of mine desiring a good scratch, the mighty tabletop. It was only a matter of time before I broke word to my two friends, now roommates, that I wanted to run a game of Fallout. Oh, Fallout tabletop, that's so good, you get your D100 percentile. <laughs> God damn. I only played it once, and I played as a robot, but Ramtide was the GM, and uh, it was pretty cool. Having been the one to have cultured their prolific magic addiction several years ago, this suggestion was met with much excitement. My choice in nerdery was par excellence. <laughs> uh, and they knew that I would host a game worthy of legend and memory. There was a catch, however. Our number was only three. Myself, being the GM, and my two roommates. And this is simply not enough. I informed them then that if they could recruit a third member to our party, I would begin the game promptly the following Sunday. I gave them a link to the rulebook that we'd be using and informed them to roll up some characters, and also said that if they had any questions, they should just ask me, and I'd gladly help them work through whatever problems they were having. And so, our initial party was set. 
Real ghouls and robots. Everybody, ghoul and robot. You don't have to worry about radiation. Super sweet. <laughs> and here's the cast list. We've got Ramtide, your dutiful lord and master, the eternal GM, road pirate extraordinaire, and Tendi, aficionado. Mount Fuji, a massive, towering idiot of a man-child who felt it only appropriate to roll a super mutant stand-in of himself and he was also my best friend in the state of New Mexico. Well, I guess super mutants good. Okay, robots, ghouls, and super mutants. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, a charismatic orator and gunslinger, and my other roommate who, admittedly, is an antisocial shut-in and thinks firearms should be universally banned. Well, that's pretty ironic, don't you think? I like guns, but only when we're playing Imagination Time. <laughs> Aye, then. <laughs> our gruesome twosome set to work making their characters and I pondered just who might turn up as our illustrious third. It wasn't long however until an opportunity to fill that vacant slot presented itself. Thomas Jefferson would often invite our next door neighbor over to come smoke his weed and play some FIFA. Well I hate FIFA but if you got some dope. <laughs> it was a lanky skeleton of a man, his face riddled with acne scars. The stench of stale cigarettes and onions pervaded his pitiable form. Ugh. I guess this is the beard of the story? I mean, technically, they're all beards of the story. <laughs> it's just four neck beards, but this one is like on a different degree, you know? I guess we'll see. When he wasn't busy playing FIFA or smoking TJ's weed, he would awkwardly follow around TJ's girlfriend and try to make small talk. Ugh, creep but was never able to make eye contact. He's the type of guy to ask you to please respond <laughs> after an awkward silence. Well, not as deep into the positive spectrum of nerdity like our merry household, he was certainly on some spectrum, and it made me ponder whether or not I ought to actually invite him to our tabletop. Ah, come on, give him a chance, little weed-smoking freeloader snake in the grass. <laughs> Just give him enough rope to hang himself so we can have a story. How about that? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, however, beat me to the punch one morning over a stoned match of FIFA, and our neighbor agreed to come participate. Like the others, I gave him the rule book and my phone number, and I informed him that, should need be, he could always ask me to help him fill in his character sheet. He seemed excited, genuinely enthusiastic, that we were opening up to him and inviting him to come hang out and play tabletop with us. Maybe I could forge a dungeon delver out of this rough cut diamond, I mused. <laughs> Best of luck! With our game set, the week whittled away as I drafted campaign notes and worked, all eyes set upon that coming Sunday. I heard nothing from my players as the week wore on, and assumed then that they had managed to successfully draft up characters of their own without my assistance. At long last, Sunday morning rolled around, and I crawled out of my bed and went down to the living room, enjoying a fresh cup of morning coffee. Thomas Jefferson was stuck at work that morning, so it was just Mount Fuji and myself in the house, just kind of poking around as we waited for game time. <laughs> Poking each other's buttholes, am I right? <laughs> Got him. <laughs> uh, we filled the morning, talking a little bit about the campaign that we were about to undergo, and I reviewed Fuji's character sheet one last time, just to make sure it was up to snuff. Everything looked good. Eventually, Thomas Jefferson got home from work, cleaned up, and adjourned down in the living room with his dice and sheet as well. And we waited. It was now five minutes to game time, and... Our neighbor had not arrived. You're such a timely fellow, Ramptide. What's up with that? <laughs> For a vagabond drifter, I don't think uh, time would mean that much, but he's like, God damn it, we have a game and we're doing it this time. Be there. I nudged Thomas Jefferson. After all, our neighbor was predominantly his friend, and I asked him if he wanted to go and possibly rouse our third player. Perhaps he had just forgotten what time we were supposed to convene. I mean, these things do happen. Thomas got up from his seat, went next door, and knocked. He didn't return until almost 20 minutes later, with our neighbor in tow, admittedly glassy-eyed and a bit stumbly. He had been day drinking this morning and passed out. 
fairly typical considering what I had seen of him. Oh, this boy's a mess. <laughs> you know I'll play tabletop with this boy. He's a mess. Cut it right now. He came in and sat down at the table with us with a sup guys and beamed around at everyone in his mental fog. I asked him if he was ready for the game to begin. Neighbor, um, well, yeah, but, but can you help me with my character real quick? OP, of course. What you got for me? He just shrugged and looked at me expectantly. He had prepared nothing. <laughs> I told you, man, pull the plug. He hadn't put one single iota of thought into making a character. He hadn't even tried. I don't even think he looked at the rule book in retrospect. 20 minutes late to the session, with no fucking character, and not so much as even a concept of what he wanted to play as. I glowered a bit as I debated just what to do. Eventually, Fuji and Thomas Jefferson decided to go watch some anime, while I walked our neighbor through the process of character creation. <laughs> God. Uh, terrible. Let's give this lad the name of his character, as is our standard naming convention. So now he's Kirk McGurk instead of the neighbor. An obese human in a mobility scooter <laughs> with a penchant for fixing things up and our rather strange alcoholic of an next door neighbor. Did he choose a mobility scooter? Or is that like Ramtide's little <laughs> bit of spice added? <laughs> How you gonna take a mobility scooter across the Mojave wasteland, man? And of course, Ram clarifies that Kurt was the one who insisted on this backstory. Kurt had been foraging the ruins of a derelict supermarket when a shelf full of canned lard fell on top of him. <laughs> <laughs> pinning him to the ground where he lay. Unable to move and subsequently trapped, he sustained himself on those cans of lard that had fallen about him. Slowly and steadily, his bulk grew in size until he had grown so massive that the shelf simply shifted from atop him, freeing him from this miserable death trap. However, he had now grown so massive from consuming so much lard that his mobility was severely impaired. <laughs> Uh, I will say, at least the dude seems to have a sense of humor. I'm loving this backstory, honestly. He crawled about the abandoned supermarket until he found an old mobility scooter, and by whatever small luck he had, managed to make it function once again. Now he rode across the wasteland astride his mobility scooter that he has dubbed his trusty steed. <laughs> Searching the ruins of various grocery stores to sustain his ever-increasing girth. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it. It's annoying that he couldn't come up with this, like, before the game, but maybe he's winning some points back. <laughs> I was highly amused at the idea of this colorful character. At the same time, however, I knew that this would cause complications in the grand scheme of him playing. There aren't any wheelchair ramps out in the wasteland, you know? <laughs> OSHA isn't gonna write you a citation for making your dungeon of despair inaccessible to the handicapped. <laughs> Despite my objections, he absolutely insisted. And I eventually caved. I gave his character concept my seal of approval, although hesitantly, and started trying to walk him through the rest of character creation. After several lengthy minutes of explaining how to allocate special points and calculate stats, however, he looked at me helplessly before he had even tried to figure it out for himself. And he asked me if I could just do it for him. Oh, so sloth is uh, not just a trait of his character. <laughs> I see now where the idea came from. OP says, bro, at least try, Kurt. I don't get it, man. Come along. Just help me out here. Fifteen minutes late, with no character, wants to roll up a fucking meme, won't even try to learn the system. Do I really need more red flags to know that this isn't going anywhere? <sighs> Apparently, I do. <laughs> 
I rolled up some stats in line with what he had envisioned his character to be. A high perception, high intelligence character with low endurance and agility. Proficient in repair, pilot, and science. With this final hurdle out of the way, I looked at the clock. We were now an hour and a half past the point which I had anticipated actually beginning the session. And only just now were we finally ready to start. Ugh. I summoned Fuji and Thomas Jefferson back to the table. They arrived, took their seats, and I struck up with my best narrative voice, regaling them with our latest tale of intrigue while Kurt sank balls deep into his cellular device. Oh my god. <laughs> How could he possibly seem enthused? Did he not know what this is? Session Zero's a bust. Nope out now. <laughs> the year was 2277. The party had been traveling with a merchant caravan bearing east from Las Vegas to the recently taken and fortified Boulder City, well within NCR territory. The dam had recently been restored to functionality and had become a trading hub and population center in the greater Mojave wasteland. Unbeknownst to its garrison, however, the drums of war were beating just across the Colorado River. The Legion. <laughs> the party arrived at the outskirts of Boulder and were given the freedom to explore the merchant quarter of the city. While Thomas Jefferson and Mount Fuji took the hint and went to go and spend their initial nest egg of caps on gear, Kurt, after having his attention jarred loose from his stupid phone, decided to roll around the small hamlet seeking sustenance for his prodigious bulk. <laughs> this joke's gonna get old real fast. I decided then to lure him in with the dilapidated storefront of an old grocery store. Without missing a beat, he rolled up to the door, and after a grueling attempt at passing an agility check to finagle his mobility scooter through the portal, <laughs> he wound up inside the ruined shop. The place had long since been picked clean by locals and scavengers, but this did not deter Kurt from picking through the trash. <laughs> Wanting to make his first role-playing experience something to remember, I put a shout out to his backstory. A single can of lard was untouched at the very top of a shelf. His eyes lit up, and he immediately proudly declared, they was gonna reach up for it from his perch atop his trusty steed. One failed agility check later, and he lay pinned beneath a fallen shelf and a toppled mobility scooter, the coveted can of lard just beyond his ham-fisted grasp. <laughs> oh yeah, we go in his circles. What's the definition of insanity? <laughs> I switched over to Mount Fuji and TJ, who had been left to roleplay to their own devices. At this announcement, Kurt interjected, Bleh, What happened? And I assured him that he would return to the center of attention quite soon enough. He seemed to glower at this for a bit, and returned to his handheld screen. I roleplayed their transactions for a bit, and as soon as they acquired what they deemed a sufficient amount of gear, they prepared to wander off to find their missing compatriot Kurt. Before they could exit the town, a barrage of gunfire erupted in the distance, and a scout came running, red-faced. Scout, We're under attack! They came from across the dam and poof! He was cut short as a bullet shattered his skull, and viscera sprayed across the awestruck duo. Merchants abandoned their stalls, soldiers garrisoned themselves in the adjacent buildings, several legionnaires appeared, and combat began. I ran through the player sequences as the battle unfolded in the square, Thomas Jefferson had taken cover behind an overturned cart and opened fire on one legionary that menaced him thoroughly with a combat knife. Well, Mount Fuji ran in to engage, swinging his hammer wildly for a complete miss. <laughs> and then I returned to Kurt, still pinned beneath a supermarket shelf in the grocery store. <laughs> OP, the town's under attack. You hear screams and gunfire erupting from the town square not far from your current position, wherein you are pinned beneath a shelf and a toppled scooter. Kurt looked up from his phone, asking me to repeat myself, and I did, a little more irritated than before. Kurt, did I get the can at least? OP, no, it's just out of your grasp. Kurt, I'm gonna try and get the can. God damn it, dude. 
such a beautiful character backstory and then like when it's in action the whole shit just falls on his face you can't just be a cardboard cutout bro that ain't interesting another failed agility check i asked him perhaps if he wanted to try and free himself from beneath the trap wherein he was pinned and he replied nah i'm good <laughs> and resumed his phone time. It is like pulling teeth. <laughs> Combat cycled around again, with Mount Fuji dispatching one raider, but not before incurring some wounds of his own. TJ put a few holes in the other who was approaching him, but not before taking a fierce blow to his character's HP pool. As Combat was about to circle around to Kurt again, I decided to light a fire under his ass to try and get him engaged. OP, Kurt, as you're pinned under the shelf, you hear the door to the supermarket fling wide open, and a man in what can best be described as red-painted sports gear <laughs> appears in the doorway, holding a pistol in his hand. He sees you pinned beneath the shelf. What do you do? Kurt, I play dead. He then returned to his phone. <laughs> God, dude. <laughs> OP, okay. Roll me an outdoorsman check. Kurt did not know how to roll dice, it seemed, because he asked me to do so for him. Oh my god, I want to die. <laughs> this is like transitive frustration. I want to choke him. I, I hate this dude. He won some points back with his character and then lost them all during the gameplay portion. <laughs> I picked up the D100, asked him what his skill value was, and he insisted uh, uh, he could find it as he returned again to his phone. I found his pathetically low stat, rolled the dice for him, and observed the result. His roll did not break his skill threshold. His attempt failed, and I started the legionary's turn. A hail of gunfire pelted down on our pinned fat ass. <laughs> I informed him that he took some damage, and he looked up incredulously. Kurt... What do you mean? I'm playing dead. OP, I rolled for you. It wasn't a convincing act. The raider didn't buy it, and he decided to open fire on you. Kurt, ah, that's bullshit, man. You're just targeting me because I'm new. I did my best to try and be diplomatic. OP, bro, I rolled the dice for you. You failed to succeed on your skill check. Maybe if you roll the dice yourself next time, you might actually do better. I usually don't roll very high. Call it jinxed. And that's what makes Ramtide the best game master. He never rolls high. <laughs> Kurt did not want to return to his phone again. Well, that's some success. He seemed to realize that his pork avatar was in mortal danger. <laughs> and wanting to protect his meme, he decided to focus on the session for the first time since we had began. As combat cycled around, it came to Kurt's turn once again, and he declared that this time he was going to try and free himself from beneath the shelf under which he was trapped. I had him roll a strength check, which admittedly I nerfed because I wanted the guy to succeed, you know? However, he still managed to fail. <laughs> so I nerfed it a little bit more, as it's the GM's right. <laughs> And just told him that, yeah, he managed to break free. He spent a few more action points to stagger back onto his mobility scooter, grab a pistol of his own, and return fire, successfully wounding the raider. As the raider advanced into the grocery store, I fudged the rolls just a little bit more to help him catch up. The raider, by GM Fiat, admittedly missed. See, Ramtet likes to play it all tough, but he's a nice guy. Deep down, he's a squishy little marshmallow man. <laughs> <laughs> By round three, Mount Fuji and TJ had dispatched the few legionnaires in the square and had now doubled down to find the location of their missing companion, who managed to finally dispatch the last legionary inside the grocery store. By way, once more, of a little bit of that old magic GM fiat. With the day perceivedly won and the corpses looted, Kurt triumphantly claimed his can of lard. <laughs> and wheeled his bloated carcass out into the sunlit streets to try and find his companions. 
As the troops rallied, a squad of NCR troopers were making their way towards the dam to try and retake the landmark and press the party into service. The mission was clear. They were to advance on the dam and secure the electrical generators inside from the advancing enemy force. A sound tactical decision. The party advanced into a foyer of the dam and dispatched the invaders. The commanding officer briefed the strike team once the room had been cleared, remarking that the generators could be found on a lower sub-level of the superstructure and needed to be reactivated to restore power to the dam itself. A cargo lift that I threw in there specifically for Kurt and also the surrounding areas. The fastest way there, however... Stairs. <laughs> Kurt. Now you're just targeting me, man. This isn't fucking cool. Ramtide, I told you right out of the gate that voluntarily handicapping yourself in the apocalypse was not a very good idea. I encouraged you to roll anything but a morbidly obese lard ass on a mobility scooter. <laughs> but you insisted. Now, how are you going to solve this situation? Get some ropes, planks of wood, kind of do like a little skiing thing or a pulley system. <laughs> but admittedly, it's a lot more of a pain in the ass than it's worth. Though they do have a super mutant on the team, so maybe piece of cake. Maybe he just picks them up like a little dog. <laughs> Kurt thought about this for a minute and then stood up and ripped his character sheet in half. Oh, classy. He flipped me off, <laughs> left the house, and never returned to a subsequent tabletop session that I ran for my group. I concluded the session with Mount Fuji and TJ clearing the dam, and I called it there, and once more lamented that we were down to two players. Again. I told them that as of now and into the foreseeable future, the spot was open, and that maybe they might find another who would take the game at least semi-seriously. While this particular encounter with Kurt McGurk is an amusing anecdote of a game gone sour, it's not the be-all end-all of my experiences with him because, let's face it, avoiding your next door neighbor is not an easy trick. Avoiding a spiteful, inebriated wingnut of a neighbor is much more difficult indeed. And this is just a prelude, an introduction to this individual, if you will. Rest assured, friends, that it will get much, much worse. So until next time, friends, and as always, special thanks goes out to my lovely patrons for believing in me, supporting the work that I do, and who have been an absolute blessing during my travels through this uncertain and peculiar thing that we call existence. Specifically, Nat One Nick, Dayton Does, A, that's me, <laughs> Fire Drake, DigiNZ, and Tato Ferret. My love and admiration as always to Red X and the greater Red X community. I have indeed missed you nerds. Ooh woo. <laughs> it's good to be back in the saddle, for now. Rest assured that you were missed as well, my friend, and it seems like you've had quite some adventures in the meanwhile. But I'm glad you're back, glad you're sharing them with us, and I hope life finds you well overall, of course. As far as Kurt goes, I haven't found reason to, like, completely despise him just yet. Like, okay, he's a bit of a freeloader, he's chasing around this dude's girlfriend, like... He's, he's definitely a creep, not a person that I would personally choose to hang around. But as always, I just hope for that spark of redemption, you know? That one day where he wakes up and has some self-realization spark into his mind and he's like, holy crap, I need to change the way things are going. So yes, as I said, I'm not ready to completely hate him just yet. Some people aren't into tabletop. Maybe he got into it and decided that it was all overwhelming, he's scared to ask for help, something like that. Basically trying to put myself in his shoes, and yeah, I can kind of see where he's coming from. But at the end of the day, you did kind of screw up the session with your meme character, and uh, that's unforgivable. Ramtide did the work, his roommates did the work, and you just came in here and basically ruined everything. Wasted an hour and a half of everybody's time, because you couldn't roll up a character for yourself. Which is about the simplest thing that you will do. <laughs> if you can't get past that, then get out. You ain't welcome. I didn't want to play with you anyways. 
Ah, but hopefully Rimtide will be settled down enough to possibly join in on the D&D sessions that we have going in the Discord because I know he would love to be a player instead of a GM, much like Zuka does. I'm also working on editing those videos. They're a little bit long, a little bit involved, but they should be up on the channel sooner rather than later. I don't expect them to like hit as hard as some of the other videos that we do around here, but I know there are quite a few people out there that would like to see what went on just in case they missed it. So yeah, big, big welcome back to my boy Ramtide. Looking forward to some more stories from your brother. And I'm sure everybody else in the greater Red X community will also join me in saying welcome back. Welcome back, my friend. And if you would like to say that to him, you can say it in the comments because I know he's going to be checking. <laughs> I just got to know, are we good? Don't want to have to go that other way. <laughs> if we're going to go that way, you'll need a bigger knife. Keep it curt, as we try to do, I do suppose. Ram tidings, dear friends. It is I, your dutiful lord and master, the eternal GM. Where last we parted ways, I introduced you to my next door neighbor, Kurt McGurk, by way of a Fallout tabletop game, wherein he was invited to fill our third seat, because running with two people is just so boring, don't you know? <laughs> Kurt had a fit. Believing that I was intentionally singling him out during the game for being new, despite the near unlimited patience that I exercised with him when he showed up late, drunk, without a fucking character, made me roll one up for him, that ran counter to all of my best recommendations, and he basically made me play it for him as well. After his mobility scooter ridden lard elemental failed to tackle the most devious foil of all, a flight of stairs, <laughs> he left in a huff, and our number once again dwindled to two. However, I am not one to be deterred. Will I have my tabletop game? Will Kurt live and let live? Are there wheelchair ramps in the Mojave Wasteland? <laughs> Some of these questions might be answered in this TALE FROM THE... FROM THE... THE... Ah, oh, fuck. Tabletop? Travel stop? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, it's the continuation of our tale, and it's lovingly subtitled, WE NEED TO BRING BACK DUELING. Well, this kind of relates to the leg beard episode that we had yesterday where our neckbeard had a stage duel and mock murdered a man in front of a wedding party for the hand of his wife. <laughs> that was a good one. You can find part one of this story narrated by the wonderful Red X here. Yeah, I love them plugs, boy. Also, you got 215 uh, notifications, so go check on that. <laughs> While our prelude did not necessarily warrant it, I believe that this installment very well could. Let's dispense with the pleasantries and get real. Neckbeards are gross. <laughs> Their behavior isn't much better. Uncomfortable topics and gross depictions are very likely to occur. You have been warned twice now. Oh, he said twice now, so I don't have to say twice now. High five. <laughs> A few days has passed since our last tabletop session, and it had gone much the same as any other day of the week. I'd wake up, go to work, and slave over the dish pit by evening, coming home in the dead hours of the morning to my comfy couch in the living room. Kurt would still make his desperate rounds by our door to smoke TJ's weed and play his video games, but had made it a point now to only announce his presence when I was not around. I obviously did not mind this very much. <laughs> One less beard to deal with. Try as I might, every previous time I had seen him to make him feel included and in one of the group, but he always put me off. And honestly, it was much easier to just disengage from his presence entirely. Admittedly, I was not the only one who felt this way. Mount Fuji was very much on the same page as I. He was not a fan of Kurt in the slightest, and had even talked to TJ a few times, remarking, why the hell do you invite him over anyways? Whatever, not my problem, or so I thought. <laughs> not my circus, not my monkeys, except they are. <laughs> One particularly late night, I had finished closing up shop and clocked out for the evening. 
I sat at the bar with the bartender for a bit, shooting the shit and throwing back a couple of drinks. After I polished off my final beer for the evening, I bid him a good night and stepped out into the cool night air. I rambled around the square for a bit, enjoying the breeze and the alcohol and the distant pulse of music from the local dive bar before I made my way back to the house. It was getting late, and I was ready to call it a night. A fun side anecdote irrelevant to this story that occurred the same night but was still amusing. I was still admittedly broke. I had just started working again, and having the next few days off meant that I would miss the shift meals from my job. Well, there was a pizza place nearby that usually threw out fresh pies at the end of the night, so I went to grab a couple on my way home. A hey, good old dumpster dive. We pulled this one quite a bit when we was roommates. <laughs> Ramtide's good for it. He brings back the good shit. Fresh pizza? I mean, it's in a box. It didn't touch the trash. It's still good to go. While walking back, a couple of upper crust yuppies yelled at me from a bar across the street, asking me, uh, where could they get a pizza this late? I sheepishly told them that the place I had gotten the pie from was closed, but they offered to just buy it from me. I charged them 20 bucks for a pizza that I dug out of the trash. <laughs> I'm a hustler, baby. <laughs> uh, oh, I love it. It's like a mini story that just encapsulates Ramtide as a person. <laughs> but I digress. When I at last made it to our apartment complex, I started the trek up the gravel driveway. Kurt's lights were on, and I could hear him moving around inside as I passed his door. I didn't think about it too much at the time, until I got to my door, and that's when I heard his doorway open. I looked over, and Kurt had stepped outside. He was puffing up his chest. The little manlet was trying to make himself look as big as he could. In his hand, he held a knife. Now, I've been stabbed before by uglier, meaner, more bloodthirsty people than the likes of Kurt. I've held one of my mangled limbs like it was a useless chunk of meat splayed open and down to the bone, the wound packed with an old sock while I tried to stop my unceremonious bleeding of two pints onto the concrete. It was unprovoked, it almost killed me, and really I don't like to talk about it, so you can imagine that I also don't appreciate when somebody comes at me with a drawn blade. For just a tiny moment, I could taste iron in my mouth and smell that sick, sweet scent of blood. Can confirm, Ram is a tough fucking street dog, <laughs> like one of the only people that I would literally refuse to fight. I had gotten a concealed carry weapon, and I did carry at the time. The town was full of meth junkies, and you never know when somebody was going to lose their minds on you. I have been a victim before, and I'm not the kind to let myself get victimized twice. So I dropped my pizza, drew my pistol, racked the slide, and held my ground in that poorly lit driveway staring down the sights into Kurt's chest. Ramtide, can I help you? Kurt staggered back a bit on the threshold of his doorway, staring a thousand miles off into the stucco wall that was maybe 20 feet behind me. It was just a regular day in the life of my neighbor, who, to nobody's surprise, was loaded to the gills once again. I thought for a minute that I might actually have to put him down. Kurt, oh, uh, I think it was... Like a hobo in my driveway or something. <laughs> there is. He's pointing a gun at you. <laughs> you haven't seen any, have you? Kurt knew about my travels a bit, as we had talked before about anything and everything when I had first met him. While it was not that far-fetched to assume that there was, in fact, a homeless crackhead lurking around our house, it was equally not that far-fetched to assume that he was making an indirect pass at me and trying to play coy in the face of the nine that was pointed at his chest. I assume the latter as well. <laughs> Ramtide, did you know that statistically, most people who try to fight someone with a knife end up getting wounded themselves? You should be more careful. Kurt thought about this for a minute before letting out one of his signature snorty laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> Opened the door to his house, and he threw the knife inside. He asked me what I was doing out here at such a late hour. And I told him that I just got home from work. You know, some of us actually have jobs that we have to go to. 
It had been a long night, and I was about to go in, shower, and just take a load off. And then he threw me for a loop. He asked me if I wanted to come hang out for a bit, since he was usually just up all night on his computer, and he was bored and, uh, and had nobody to hang out with. Oh, I wonder why Kurt's not more popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the hell. If I can smooth over the situation enough to where I don't have to pull a gun on this kid every night, then I might as well do so, right? I have to live next door to this shit show as it is, so... I reluctantly accepted his offer. I holstered my gun, let out a deep breath that I had been holding for far too long, and said, Sure. We went inside, and I followed him into his nest. <laughs> the first thing I noticed was, of course, the smell. It was like a urinal that had been converted into an ashtray, which was filled with stale beer and rotting food. <laughs> oh, God. Uh yeah, that's good. Numerous fist-sized holes dappled the drywall, adding a certain angst and madness-infused chic to his bachelor pad. <laughs> it was sparsely furnished. There was a chair and a table in the living room. The table and floor were covered in ashes, pill bottles, and beer cans. Kurt had staggered off into the kitchen to fetch some beers, while I satiated my curiosity and picked up one of the pill bottles. I've dabbled. I'm hip. <laughs> I know how things do. <laughs> All these other people out here, they don't think it be like it is, but it do. <laughs> God damn it. It was an empty prescription for oxys filled in someone else's name. So Kurt either sold or used opiates. Considering he never worked and was always loaded, my gut instinct was both. I heard him cursing in the kitchen, and I went to take a look. The kitchen was a special mess in its own right. I could see movement in the trash heap of takeout boxes, betraying some form of pestilent sentience left to its own devices for too long. <laughs> uh, the sink was full of dishes, submerged in water that was long overdue for a change. It had turned black and reeked of mold. Ugh. A singular burp of gas burbled up from that witch's cauldron of dining utensils. <laughs> uh, God damn, Ramtide. I miss your story so much. It's so evocative. God, too good. He was staring intently into the fridge, which was practically empty, save for a bottle of ketchup and a box of Domino's. Kurt, ah, we're out of luck, bro. Somebody drank all my beer. Ramtide, you mean you drank all your beer? <laughs> he let out another snorting chuckle. <coughs> I know if I drank my beer, dude. I'm fairly certain that I was the first person in that house besides Kurt in months, maybe years. Ramtide said, eh, it's all good, man. I got a couple in the fridge at my house. I'll just go grab them. I walked into my apartment and headed to the kitchen. The digital display blinked out the time in the darkness of the room, and it was getting rather late. I should go to bed soon. I contemplated just locking the door and passing out. <laughs> but I did want to make amends to the situation, because I had to live next door to this person who was very clearly unstable. My life would be a lot easier if he didn't think that I actively hated him even though at this point I was very much beginning to actively hate him, and I wanted to make sure that he didn't think that I was some threat to his well-being, so I grabbed the six-pack that I had tucked away from the fridge, and I made my way back to his apartment. I just walked right in. He had taken a spot right on the couch in the living room, and had popped open his laptop and started watching some meme videos. I grabbed a seat beside him, and took a beer for myself before offering him one, which he accepted. I leaned in to see what he was watching. It was fucking salad fingers. <laughs> Don't knock salad fingers, Ramtide. It's fucking classic. R know your roots, okay? <laughs> Real crowd pleaser, Kurt. I cracked my beverage and soaked in the squalor that he inhabited while he watched his shitty cartoons, <laughs> and we drank in silence for a bit. When the episode ended, I found myself getting into my second beer, 
and I seized the opportunity to waggle my peen a bit and pose a question which had been on my mind. Ramtide? Hey bro, so when I came home tonight, you came out with a knife. Who were you trying to stab? Was there really some crackhead out there? Or were you waiting for someone else? Kurt was taken aback from this question. He stammered a bit before finally spitting out a complete sentence. I, uh, I, I wasn't trying to stab anyone, bro. I, I was just trying to scare him. Ramtide? Who? Who were you trying to scare away, Kurt? <laughs> uh, this is exactly how Ramtide talks. When he brings out like the soft, serious voice, that's the scariest Ramtide I know. <laughs> Kurt didn't respond, and I already knew the answer. He wanted to put the fear of God in me, and he failed miserably. And now I was in his house calling him out about it. Look, guys, I've been stabbed shot at, beaten bloody, taken to jail, robbed blind, and left for dead, and I am still here. I've been 60 miles out each way from civilization, with no food or water, and a three-day walk ahead of me. I stared death in the face, and I said, if it comes, it comes, and it'll be about fucking time. <laughs> uh, I've slept in graveyards, ghettos, alleys, ganglands, and squat houses, like a newborn babe in its crib. I've been in more fistfights than I can recount, sometimes against unfair odds and angry mobs, and I still dove head first into them with gusto. <laughs> I remember one particular night, I got cracked in the head with a 2 by 4 my friends held me back by my overalls from the person who hit me, and warned them to leave right now, or else they were going to let me loose. I do not run. Whatever chemical in the brain that causes me to feel fear has probably burnt out those receptors a long, long time ago. And the only time it even pretends to poke its head out is when I have to experience the utmost horrifying of horrors, which is being on a fucking ladder. <laughs> uh, Tide's one true weakness, ladders! <laughs> If you want to scare me into submission, you're going to have to try a lot harder than your drunk ass coming at me with a fucking pocket knife. He was treading the fine line between burning in quiet shame and launching into a self-righteous, indignant tirade over a fucking game. And I could hear the intoxicated hamster on the wheel struggling to run circles in his head before it fell off the wheel in an exhausted heap. So, I took the opportunity to continue the discussion on my own behalf. Ramtide, it's all good, man. You just caught me off guard is all. Nobody got hurt, and nobody's worse for the wear, so it's live and let live in my book. I just hope you weren't angry with me, dude. I know the other day you came over and played some tabletop with us, and you thought I was singling you out and giving you a hard time, but I wasn't trying to do that. I just gotta know, are we good? Don't want to have to go that other way. <laughs> he thought about this for a moment and responded in the affirmative. Yeah, we're good. Just what I wanted to hear. I threw back the rest of my beer, stood up and told him I was going to head home for the evening. On the way out, he made it a point to let me know that if I needed anything, anything at all, I could always come and knock and that he could probably get it for me. I extend to you a moment of clarity, reconciliation, and reckoning, and you try to get me to buy drugs from you. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> I brushed it off, went home, and went to bed. Ah, oh, come on, Ram Time. Maybe he wasn't offering you drugs. Maybe he wanted you to come ask him for ketchup sometime. <laughs> Since that's all he has in the goddamn fridge. The following morning, I awoke surprisingly early despite how late I had been up and how much I had drank the night before. It's hard to sleep when you're on a couch in the living room, or when somebody's making pancakes? Whoa! <laughs> TJ was up bright and early, banging around the kitchen. I staggered out of bed and made my way over to the bar. Haggard and bleary-eyed, I took a seat beside his girlfriend who had spent last night over. They bid me good morning, and I bid him... Coffee now, please. Thank you. <laughs> TJ, you look like hell, Ramtite. You all right, man? 
Ramtide. First coffee, then talky. Brain can't brain right now. <laughs> he eventually got the message and got me a hot cup of that bean juice, which I cradled in my hands while I gradually came back to the waking world. At length, the ability to speak returned to me, and I told TJ of my encounter the previous night with Kurt. TJ is an amazing and wonderful human being. He's the type of guy who wants to pick up all the broken pieces of anything in the world and put it back together. He's a man with a literal heart of gold. He's not quick to judge people in regards to much of anything about them, always believing that they can improve, they can do better, and he is almost always willing to give second chances. Hell, he gave me an opportunity to get my feet under myself, which is a rare thing for anyone to extend to others in this world, and a gesture of kindness that I don't take lightly. I will literally throw blows over anyone who even looks at that guy the wrong way. It was no surprise that he had taken an interest in Kurt when they had first met. Kurt had no friends, he never left his house, and he was almost always lost in a self-induced haze. I knew that TJ's fascination with Kurt was probably rooted somehow in this clearly observable yet unspoken desire of his to right the wrongs in this world. Ah, uh, I remember my idealist face. <laughs> I just do the best that I can. I wish I could be more like TJ too, man. But the world's beaten me down a whole lot, and some of that hope has been lost. Not all, but some. And Ramtide seems to agree, because his inclination was growing that Kurt was not only a lost cause, but maybe actively dangerous. When I finish, TJ soaked it all in for a moment. It was not TJ, however, who continued the conversation with me, but his girlfriend, to whom we shall now provide a name. Mary, TJ's girlfriend, a petite and pretty little thing who admittedly is not a fan of Kurt, and like your dutiful lord and master, a bit more judgmental than the starry-eyed TJ. Mary said, He creeps me out, TJ. He always tries to follow me around whenever you invite him over, and he never gets the hint that I just want him to leave me alone. And now Ramtide had all that happen to him last night? Stop hanging out with him, babe. I don't like him. TJ weighed the concerns of his girlfriend with the events of last night, and after some careful consideration, he did acquiesce to her request, telling her that Kurt would no longer be welcome in their house anymore. With that squared away, things cheered up a bit, and he offered me some pancakes, an offer which I enthusiastically took him up on. With a belly full of breakfast and coffee, I sidled back to the living room and got comfy. It was my day off, and I was going to enjoy it. I fired up that old Xbox and popped in some Skyrim. Oh, the classic. <laughs> it's like the best way to waste the day. <laughs> it was getting to be about midday. Mary had left for her own home after spending the night over with TJ, so it was just him and I. He took a seat on the couch beside me whipped out the bong and started smoking some dope, offering me some like he always did, which I politely refused, being a non-smoker. And that's when the front door flung open. At first, I thought it was Mount Fuji coming home from wherever he was. He hadn't been around all morning after all. But after a moment passed, I realized it was Kurt, simply walking into our house without so much as fucking knocking on the door. He closed it behind him, and sat down on the couch beside TJ and asked him for a hit. No knock. No hello. No, ah, how are you guys? Just give me some weed. I paused my game, looked over at TJ, and cocked an eyebrow at him with a look that spoke the entirety of my thoughts on this matter. TJ passed the bong to Kurt, perhaps to soften the blow of the words that were coming next. TJ... Hey, so, like, I'd appreciate it if you didn't just let yourself into my house unannounced like that, Kurt. Whoa. Also, my girlfriend doesn't really like the way you act around her. You're making her nervous, man. She doesn't want to come over here anymore. And if I have to choose between you and my girlfriend, whoa, I'm going to choose her, man. So, you know, long story short, I don't want you coming over here anymore, man. Whoa. 
Kurt struggled through his hit, blindsided by the news that he was not welcome in our home anymore. When he finally caught his breath, he remarked that TJ was a pussy whipped simp and insisted that his girlfriend was overreacting about a bunch of nothing. He insisted that she'd get over it and there was no reason for them to cut off their friendship and that TJ was turning him out for no reason. <laughs> TJ, I don't care. You're making my girlfriend uncomfortable. Whoa. And if you can't respect that, then we're going to have a problem, man. Now, I had never seen TJ get mad before. I'd never heard that soft-spoken man even raise his voice, let alone utter an assertive word. For the longest time, I thought that he was incapable of doing so. Here he was, drawing his line in the sand, and I have never been prouder of that boy in my life. Proud of you, TJ. Admittedly, it was not the righteous fire of anger that I was hoping for, and it didn't seem to stop Kurt from insisting that yeah, he is being unreasonable. But TJ dug into his position and concluded with one simple sentence. You need to leave and don't come back. Whoa. <laughs> the revelation of these words didn't sit well with Kurt. He stood up from the couch and flew into a rage, shouting his god complex at TJ. Kurt, well, fuck you, TJ. You can't tell me what to do. I own this place, you hear me? I, I fucking own all of it. You just messed up, man. I'm going to get you evicted, and I'm going to take your job and your fucking girlfriend, dude. Fuck you. I shot right up off the couch, as did TJ, and we both started closing in on him. Not in this fucking house. And we started moving him to the door. TJ, for the first time in his life, was swearing at the top of his lungs with a surprising amount of machismo that I did not think that he possessed. I wanted to put Kurt's head through the drywall, just like Kurt had done with his fist to his apartment so many times before, but TJ was in the middle of us both and my opportunity did not present itself. <laughs> I believe you would have done it too. TJ eventually got him outside, locked the door, and returned to the couch. TJ was visibly shaking with anger. It must have been the first time that he ever got mad in his life by the way that he was riled up. I, on the other hand, let out a good laugh about the situation and finally accepted the offer of smoking some weed for the first time in months. Hell yeah, dude. You're gonna be high school stoned on your day off. That sounds like the best. <laughs> the rest of the day passed relatively uneventfully. We just hung out, played video games, and shot the shit about how much of an unhinged weirdo our next door neighbor was. And we mused that perhaps now, finally, the question of him bothering us had been solved for good. TJ eventually called Mary and told her that Kurt wouldn't be coming around anymore and I assume that she expressed nothing but gratitude and relief. The next few days were spent in quiet, sane, rational boredom, <laughs> without any sign of our next door wingnut. Collectively, the house breathed a sigh of relief, envisioning that our problems were simply dealt with by the virtue of the fact that we had stood up to them, said enough, and put our feet down. In more polite society, that's often plenty. But I could not escape, however, a brooding sentiment in the back of my mind that this war had not yet been won. Oh, cliffhanger! <laughs> Special thanks goes out to my lovely patrons for believing in me, supporting the work that I do, and who have been an absolute blessing during my travels through this uncertain and peculiar thing that we call existence. Specifically, Nat one Nick, Dayton Does, that's me, <laughs> Fire Drake, DigiNZ, and Tato Ferret. My love and admiration, as always, to Red X and the greater Red X community. And I think I forgot to do it last episode, but uh, I'm going to toss Ramtide's Patreon in the description right at the top. If you do want to help support him, he's making like a pirate RPG tabletop game. Looks pretty sweet, but mostly I'm just in it to like, you know, help out a friendo. So yeah, Kurt is definitely out of hand at this point. But what are you going to do? Turn and run? Ramtide don't run. <laughs> 
So we know there is going to be uh, a fight of some sort in the climax. Maybe you just pull out that nine and kneecap the dude and <laughs> then build stairs in front of his house. And then the game comes to life. <laughs> God damn, that's funnier than it should be to me. I'm pretty curious about what Kurt said during his like fit of rage where he's like, I own this place, etc., etc. Does he really? Maybe that's why he doesn't work, because he's secretly the landlord. <laughs> the landlord that lives in squalor and can't afford a maid. Yeah, I don't know if I buy it 100%, but it is possible. Maybe he actually does hold some sort of power over the owner of the place. I guess that time will tell, but I do know that uh, it's going to get uglier before it gets better. But we can discuss it more in the Discord. I'll be hanging out in there for about uh, two or three hours tonight. If you guys want to stop by, chit-chat. And then you can become disillusioned by how much of a wet blanket I am when I'm forced to interact with others. <laughs> oh, maybe that's not 100% accurate. But in my mind it is. I'm always like, am I boring? People seem to like the videos. But as a person, you don't get a, a like system for conversations that you have. So I'm always a little bit neurotic. <laughs> I saw him there with a handful of gravel throwing rocks at the bathroom window. That is our song! I don't even like that song though. <laughs> no Tate Bene. Am I saying that right? <laughs> I'm so bad with the Latin, you guys. I, I, I never can get a grasp on it. <laughs> but I guess that's why it's a dead language, isn't it? Anyways, Ram Tidings, dear friends. It is I, your dutiful lord and master, the Eternal GM. Where last we left off, our neighborly neckbeard, one Kurt McGurk, accosted me in the driveway of our apartment complex with a knife in his hand one evening after I had gotten off of work. I tried to defuse the situation in the most diplomatic way possible, but after relaying my story to my roommate, Thomas Jefferson, his girlfriend Mary requested that he sever ties, and to my surprise and Kurt's chagrin, TJ indeed stood his ground and informed Kurt that he was no longer welcome in his house. Everyone thought that the problem of our neckbeard neighbor had then been solved, and that our lives could go on as usual, despite the lingering feeling in my gut that this was in fact not the end. And so we delve once more into this tale of beardery and intrigue, lovingly subtitled, A Noteworthy Development. Oh, we're missing like the echo and the tales from the etc, etc. I mean, I'm slightly sad, but I'm also proud of you, Ram Type, for breaking the mold, you know? <laughs> you don't want to fall into like a pattern or whatever. Neckbeards are gross. Their behavior isn't much better. There may be uncomfortable topics or disgusting descriptions. You have been warned twice now. I love that. <laughs> to bring you up to speed, Red X has narrated our story so far, and those narrations can be found at the following links. Part 1 and Part 2. Oh, he did check his notifications. Good job. But now you still got five. You gotta click on that thing all the time. YouTube's always notifying me about some dumb stuff like, Hey, so-and-so liked your comment. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to know unless they actually reply. Anywho, almost a week had passed without sight nor sound of Kurt coming around our door. It was peaceful, to say the least. Mary came over and felt at ease. TJ got to keep all of his weed, and I wasn't accosted by knife-wielding maniacs in the driveway. <laughs> we lived in Mayberry again, an idyllic slice of paradise all to ourselves. The days came and went peacefully, and without interruption or upset, everything was right in the world. It was so perfect that one night, after coming home from work, I even saw a post-it note up on our door that read, I love you, Mary, scrawled in hasty chicken scratch. How sweet. TJ's leaving love notes for his girlfriend. She must be coming over tonight, and he thought that he'd leave her a little surprise. I went inside, washed up, and went to bed. The following morning, I awoke and made some breakfast in the kitchen. TJ and Mary came down from the upstairs not long after, and as I sipped my coffee over the bacon and eggs, I greeted those two amorous lovebirds a hearty good morning. I jokingly called TJ a gaylord for Mary <laughs> in good brotherly jest. 
citing the note on the door and how cute I thought it was. I told him it was so sweet that it gave me diabetes. TJ, what are you talking about? Oh my god! Ramtide, bro, there's a post-it note on the door that says, I love you, Mary. That wasn't you? TJ, what? No! TJ got up from the couch where he sat and opened the front door, where the post-it note still stuck to the exterior. His brow furrowed as he looked at it before he took it down, crumpled it up, and threw it in the trash. TJ, Ramtide, are you playing a prank on me? Whoa! Ramtide, no man, I swear that was there when I came home last night, and I thought it was you. Mmm, the plot thickens! There's really only one antagonist, though, so <laughs> we know who did it. <laughs> we enjoyed an awkward moment of silence while TJ mulled over the origins of this note. I, however, felt that same sinking feeling in my gut that I felt the other day when we routed Kurt from our house. Deep within my bones, the knowledge of where that note originated echoed up from the base of my soul. Kurt was not done. As unstoppable as a smitten neckbeard's affection, quite literally in this case. <laughs> I finished my breakfast and my cup of coffee in quiet contemplation. I was certain that TJ had drawn the same conclusions and did not feel the need to explain the situation any further. With the morning hours slowly whittling away, TJ had to get ready for work and drop Mary back off at her house. This morning, the place was all mine and I would spend it alone until I had to go to work later that evening. Hey, sweet. A little more time for Skyrim? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> TJ bid me a good day and went out the door with Mary, leaving me alone in the house. I ruminated upon what I would do with my morning hours. I opted then that the morning would best be spent out in the garden, so I threw my boots on and stepped out into the backyard. I'd started a small crop of beans, melons, and tomatoes, with marigolds tastefully placed between each row of plants to attract bees and repel insects. Man, everybody's out here doing the home garden thing. It's a really good idea, honestly. And though I'm loath to say, it is more constructive than sitting on your ass and playing Skyrim all day. <laughs> but I know what I'd prefer. Some things never change. It was a lovely little corner that I had claimed for my own personal cultivation in this desolate hellscape and it brought me a great sense of joy and pride that here, in this barren desert, I was cultivating a tiny little corner of life with my own two hands, and I would be damned if that tiny little corner of desert did not thrive. Today the sun was particularly vicious, as it is wont to be in the highlands of north-central New Mexico, and the job that I had prepared for the day was setting up some shade cloth to protect my fledgling babies. Oh, Ramtide, you're going to be such a great dad as long as you can leave your babies outside all the time. <laughs> I set to work with a shovel, digging out holes for several posts, upon which I intended to rig their shelter. With this first task complete, I cut several lengths of 2x4s and set them upright in the dugouts, filling them in with dirt and adding water to cement the ample clay in the soil. It was during this post setting that I heard a loud thump behind me. I turned around to see what strange origin produced this percussive noise that had arrested my attention, but I couldn't determine its source. I shrugged it off and resumed filling in the post upon which I was working, mixing clay and mud to form the foundation wherein the post would be firmly held in place. As I stood back to survey my handiwork, I saw from the corner of my eye a stone sailing through the air from the front of the apartment complex before it landed in the dirt of the garden with a hard thud. <laughs> I went over to pick up the rock. Barely holding on to the surface was a post-it note, its adhesive choked with bits of grit and sand. It read, I'm sorry. I'm gay, Mary. I'm moving to Guatemala. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the worst plan ever. <laughs> He expected her to find a note outside and assume it's from her boyfriend. <laughs> oh, God. Kurt. I shouted to nobody in particular towards the front of the apartment complex to knock it off. I heard the sound of somebody scampering around in the back 40 of the complex 
and then a door slammed shut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, God. This boy drunk himself stupid for real. <laughs> so sad. Uh, uh, I resumed my work, setting the last remaining posts. I ran some extra lengths of 2x4s horizontally across the beams, screwing them to the post to form a lattice upon which I could staple my shade cloth. With those in place, I rolled out the mesh and tacked it to the top of the framework that I had built. Oh, ram tight, so handy. <laughs> I admired my handiwork before grabbing the hose and turning on the water. I gave my little babies a good drought of cold water before returning inside to figure out what else I could waste my morning on. There was nothing else left to do by way of chores, however, so... I decided then to opt for a traditional time sink. More Skyrim. God damn, I called it. <laughs> Please don't tell me you're playing a, a sneaky archer in Skyrim like everybody does. Go pure magic user if you want a real challenge. Or uh, go full melee if you want a really easy <laughs> stroll through the park. Uh, the hours dropped off the clock. And the time wherein I had to get ready for work was fast approaching. Aww. After shouting down yet another dragon for those sweet, sweet bones, <laughs> I saved my progress and went upstairs to clean up and get ready. I dropped Trow, sat atop my throne, and gave a good, hearty push, lamenting the fact that I hadn't eaten enough fiber. <laughs> like almost TMI. <laughs> Why is this relevant? When my concentration was broken and my poop scared back up into my butthole <laughs> uh, i think we've all been there by an insistent thud against the bathroom window i looked out to see a long length of stick banging against the glass a post-it note on the end of the pole being mashed against the window notice me unintelligible <laughs> after all the years on the road <laughs> it was nice to have moments of peace. I could sleep inside at peace, sit alone inside at peace, have a garden which I could work alone in, in peace, and yes, even poop inside in gracious peace. Have you ever woken up under a highway bridge with a doo-doo in your butt and <laughs> at the nearest place to poop is half a mile away? And you can't even begin to think about navigating down the steep hillside slope without worrying about shitting yourself. So <laughs> uh, I could safely say no. I've never done this. <laughs> and so you just, well, you know, hunker up against the framework and do your best not to lock eyes with the morning traffic that's driving by underneath. <laughs> uh, it's fucking bullshit. Pooping in peace had become a sacred ritual to me, and now this asshole was invading the safety of my shrine. Oh, I am noticing you, Kurt, and I'm getting pissed off. I let out an exasperated sigh, and with one final forceful push, let loose a cheese-choked log into the bowl. <laughs> uh, wiped and flushed it down. I glanced at my phone, and I questioned whether or not I had time to actually go confront this prick. It takes 10 seconds to sock somebody in the jaw. Not even. <laughs> Cut it short, wipe it deep. It's gonna be fine. Also, if you miss Ramtide's waffle stomping video, that's a grand adventure that I'll link in the description. <laughs> about pooping in the shower. Ah, I'm very anal retentive about time. I'm compulsively early for everything that I do. I can't explain why I'm that way, it is just how I am. And that's true, which I think is really weird for a hobo, but <laughs> ramp time breaks the mold, I'm gonna tell you that. And when I say compulsive, I mean like stupidly compulsive, with easily an hour and a half to kill before I actually needed to leave for work. I decided that I would spend it wisely. The shower could wait. I went downstairs and out to the backyard, Along the side of the house existed what we collectively referred to as the Back 40, which was really just a glorified strip of side yard that ran past all the units and all the way down to the streets. There were fences separating small sections of this yard out for each tenant, but ours had completely fallen into a state of disrepair. As I rounded the corner into this Back 40, there I saw Kurt, 
busily fixing another post-it note to his pole. <laughs> Ram died. What the fuck are you doing? Kurt jumped in surprise and turned to face me. In his drunken stupor, he mumbled that, I'm not doing anything. You can't prove I'm doing anything. You didn't see it. <laughs> Ram died. Look, you're leaving weird fucking notes all over my house, and you need to knock it the hell off. TJ doesn't want you coming around. He doesn't want to see you. And neither does Mount Fuji, and neither do I, for that matter. So get the fuck out of our yard and go inside your goddamn house. Now! Kurt mumbled a few more things about how much of an asshole I was, and that he really wasn't doing anything, and that I wouldn't understand his feelings about Mary anyways. There's something about Mary. <laughs> and I reiterated my orders more firmly than before. He threw his pole down and went inside his house, shutting the door behind him once more. With him gone, I examined the fence and evaluated how best to repair it. I fished out my tools and ran a couple of 2 by 4s along the boards, tacking into the vertical boards before mounting a couple of brackets on the barrier to the other fence that ran along our property line, separating our apartment complex from the one next door. With a new barrier erected, and still an hour to go before I actually had to leave for work to make it on time, I finally went upstairs and took that wonderful shower. I got naked, got into the stall, and let the hot water soothe away the agony of these interactions with my neighbor as I mused to myself just how this encounter was going to end. With him unable to get into the backyard and his pole taken away... <laughs> He wouldn't be mashing post-it notes onto our windows anymore. At length, I got out of the shower and looked out the window at the notice me note still flapping in the breeze of the day just outside the bathroom, and I debated whether I wanted to take it down or to leave it up as a reminder to my roommates that our neighbor was in fact a complete wingnut. I opted for the latter. <laughs> I got dressed, went downstairs, and grabbed a sheet of paper penning a note of my own for Mount Fuji and TJ, regaling them with the events of this morning, and that they were, as of this moment in time, handled. With my business concluded, I left for work, and arrived an hour and a half early, as is usually the case, and I enjoyed a cup of coffee in the back of the house before my shift actually began. The night flew by, and before I knew it, I was headed home once again. It was Friday, which meant that Fuji and TJ had the next day off. When I came home, they were up late, watching movies and playing magic in the living room. I staggered in, said, What's up? And went to go for the shower. Fuji, Hey bro, we got your note! Ram tied, Yeah? And? Fuji, Kurt also came knocking. He insisted that you were trying to frame him or something. Like, he said that he caught you sneaking around the house, leaving weird post-it notes for Mary. Ram tied, Neat. You guys believe him? <laughs> we all bursted into laughter. Oh yeah, they'd caught me red-handed, all right. That's me, framing innocent neckbeards left and right of trying to stalk and harass their waifus and neighbors. <laughs> it took about two or three minutes before we all calmed down, wherein TJ then thanked me for fixing the fence and for calling out Kurt for his shenanigans. Apparently TJ and Fuji told Kurt to fuck off and if they found so much as a single post-it plastered to any of their windows again, they would call the cops on him. He responded with the same magnificent quip that he had delivered to me earlier, a surefire way to defuse any situation. I didn't do anything. You can't prove that I did anything. Is this hipster beard? <laughs> You've got all this evidence and he's like, objectively, you can't prove it. <laughs> Bro... I saw you with the stick and the post-its. What else do you want? TJ, yeah, I don't think we'll be finding any more weird notes around the house. Oh my God. I agreed and went upstairs to take my after work shower. As I relaxed under the water, I stared at the notice me note once more as I meditated and wondered if perhaps this was the end of Kurt's shenanigans. However, despite it all, 
That sinking feeling inside my gut had just not left. The events of the last 24 hours, while relatively benign compared to being menaced with a knife, demonstrated to me that he had not taken to heart the message that we wanted nothing to do with him, that he wouldn't take responsibility for his actions, even when caught red-fucking-handed and asked to stop. All of this did not lend any promise to a pleasant conclusion of the situation at hand, and the tapping outside my window confirmed my suspicions. What the hell was he doing now, I wondered. I had fixed the fence. He had no way into our stretch of yard, wherein he could mash his goddamn pole against the glass, like the inebriated fool that he was. I got out of the shower, and I looked outside. In the dim, incandescent lamplight of his porch, I saw him there, with a handful of gravel, throwing rocks at the bathroom window. <laughs> Is this still all for Mary? Does Ramtide have, like, the same body type as Mary? <laughs> I know for a fact he doesn't. Ramtide's a portly man-child. According to Ramtide's description, Mary is petite and cute. So why does Kurt keep harassing Ramtide specifically? Oh, God. Dude needs a hobby for real. I put my clothes on and ran downstairs. Ramtide, Fuji, TJ, get your shoes on. We're going next door. They looked up from their massive sprawl of magic cards and asked me what for. I informed them that our windows were now being pelted with gravel by a certain megalomaniac next door. Fuji sprang into action first with a loud and sassy, HELL NO! While TJ half-heartedly insisted that, you know, if we just left him alone, he'd eventually get maybe stop of his own volition, whoa. Wishful thinking, TJ. He was not going to stop. He was bent on being a pain in our collective asses. Mount Fuji and I went over to his door and found it unlocked. We went inside of his nest, wading through the garbage towards the den, wherein we could see him cocking his arm back to toss another rock at our window. Fuji started up, declaring something akin to, If you throw that rock, you're a dead man! And Kurt gave pause, probably wondering how the hell we could get into his house in the first place. Kurt... I, I didn't do! Ramtide, shut the fuck up! He obliged and did not complete his sentence, and I broke into a scathing indictment of his behavior while Mount Fuji loomed ominously like the massive mountain of a man that he was right behind me. Ramtide, I'm gonna break this down for you once. You're not gonna say anything. You're gonna listen, and you're gonna fucking listen well. We've tried to make amends. You threatened me with a knife. You scare Mary. We don't want you coming around our house. None of us. Not TJ, not Fuji, not Mary, and definitely not me. We don't want to hear from you. We don't want to smell you. We don't want to see you. We don't want your shadow to ever darken our fucking doorway. We don't want to read your stupid notes. We don't want to hear your goddamn rocks tapping on our windows. We don't want to have to come over here again. Fuck calling the cops. I have half a mind to drop you right where you stand. Consequences be damned. You're pissing us off, and I highly, highly recommend for your safety and sanity that you stop what you're fucking doing and pull your head out of your ass before I push it up there so deep that your neck snaps. This is your one warning. Next time, it won't end so pleasantly. Let's go, Fuji. Kurt had the look of a deer in headlights. I don't think he had actually been threatened before, let alone by two large men who had decided to let themselves into his apartment without his permission. He tried to stammer out some words about how, oh, we were trespassing, but we were already halfway through the garbage and out the door, and about how, oh, we would regret harassing him, or whatever other bullshit diatribe he was spewing. While I knew that this situation was more likely than not to end unpleasantly, somehow I doubted that I would possess any regrets from the climax of this situation. I chuckled softly on my way out, while Kurt stammered impotently in his heap of garbage and broken drywall. <laughs> oh, it paints such a picture. What a mess of a human being. I'll be so glad when he gets handled. 
and I know we will, <laughs> we retired to our apartment for cards and movies and had ourselves a rousing game of Commander as we listened to the tortured shouts of an angry, inebriated man banging around his apartment, smashing his sheetrock and cursing our existence at the top of his lungs. Every rage-filled shout solicited more snickers from Fuji and myself, <laughs> and looks of concern from TJ, who clearly did not want this situation to escalate any further. Don't get me wrong, I mean, nobody wanted this situation to escalate, but that sinking feeling in my gut had become a rising fire in my chest, and I decided that if Kurt wanted to escalate, then shit yeah, I was going to escalate in kind. Sometimes, the only way to put out a fire is to burn up all the fuel, and my course of action now set directed me on an explosive collision course with none other than the atrocity next door, whom I call Kurt McGurk. Oh god, I don't know how these Ramtide stories are just so good, man. I eat it up. I know the conclusion is gonna be fucking badass, just like the Adelaide saga. It kept me waiting and waiting and then fucking put me on a rocket to the moon. Gah! But I will wait patiently for the next entry, like the good boy that I am. <laughs> As always, Ramtide would like to thank his wonderful, beautiful, loving patrons who have supported and helped me and the work that I do during this strange and peculiar journey through life. Special thanks specifically goes out to Nat One Nick, Calvicus, Dayton Does, Das Me, Fire Drake, DigiNZ, and Tato Ferret. My love and admiration, as always, to Red X and the greater Red X community. Jesus Christ, man. What a mess of a human being. What a mess of a situation. It always sucks to uh, get into fights with your neighbor, whether that's a physical altercation or not. And so far, thankfully, it hasn't turned physical, but uh, that's the way that I assume that it's probably going to go, considering that he pulled out a knife or whatever. Though Ramtide, for as strong and brutish as he is, is also uh, a rather clever gentleman. And I think we got a glimpse into that by saying that you need to burn up all the fuel for the fire. So perhaps he's just going to endlessly piss him off until the dude has no energy left to do anything. Or at least piss him off to the point where he makes a stupid mistake and they can get him forcibly removed. Something like that. I mean, you could call the fucking health department, I assume. <laughs> and they would get him out of there in no time at all. That is not the type of situation that you want to be living next door to. Good God. Even if the dude was uh, completely mild-mannered, like, that's super uncool. You think the, the rats and cockroaches are going to respect the boundary line between your apartments? Hell no. That dude is infesting everybody. Ugh. I'm really quite amazed at how he thought his uh, post-it note situation was going to go. Like, <laughs> slaps a post-it note up for Mary and she's like, Oh my god, a post-it note. My panties are so wet now. <laughs> like, dude, just check into reality once in a while, okay? Absolutely pathetic mess of a human being with basically zero chance of recovering from that, so... All we can do is stand back and point our fingers and, and have a good hearty laugh about it. <laughs> and hope that it ends as explosively as things did with Adelaide and Duster. Oh my god, fingers crossed. I don't think I've ever laughed as hard as I laughed in that video. But we might change that all with Kurt McGurk. So I'm definitely keeping an eye out for it. The day that it is posted, it's going up. I can't hold it back any longer. Just give it to me, Ramtide. <laughs> god damn it. I need it. Ah, whatever, kid. Go home. Go home. Go home. Go home. Go home. Posted by Ramtide just now. Wow, that is exceedingly fresh. That's the freshest we've ever had. <laughs> Showdown with Kurt. Yeah, boy. Red X is the neckbeard king. You may uh, have guessed that I added that for myself. <laughs> I just had to add a little something, you know. Leave my mark. Rem tidings, dear friends. It is I, your dutiful lord and master, the eternal GM. I apologize for the delay in getting this installment to you, dear friends, but it seems that I am always busy these days. Oh, feel that. However, I have found the time, as of this moment, to continue and conclude the riveting tale of one neckbeard known as Kurt McGurk. I think I spelled it wrong in the title. Whoopsie. 
This one is lovingly subtitled Fly Swatting. Uh oh. Should you not be up to speed on the tale so far, you can find a riveting narration done by none other than Red X himself at the following links. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3. Only four parts, I mean short but sweet saga. I guess we'll just have to see how it ends. As is the case with neckbeards, the odds are good that there will be disgusting depictions or uncomfortable topics. You have been warned twice now. Second disclaimer. <laughs> so, Kurt had provoked the ire of the collective household, and for a while, things tapered off again into the realm of sanity. Somewhere, somehow, the idea that he should perhaps cease and desist seemed to have penetrated his exceedingly thick skull. One fine morning, while Fuji and I had left to get some breakfast, he even came over and apologized to TJ, or so we were told. He refused, however, to interact with Fuji or I, and had made a recent habit of leaving his front door open and shooting us dirty looks every time either of us passed by. <laughs> Was that thing the Buddhists say about holding a grudge? Holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die or something like that. If only this ending would be so easy. <laughs> it was a fine day, like any other. However, wherein I had tended the garden and then settled in for some day wasting on the Xbox when Fuji came in the front door with a devilish grin on his face. <laughs> Fuji... Ramtide, Kurt left his door open and he's passed out on his couch. <laughs> Ramtide, what did you do, Fuji? Fuji, nothing yet, but why waste the opportunity? <laughs> I thought I would invite you along first. I should have said no. <laughs> My conscience told me that I ought to just go back to playing Skyrim and forget that Fuji had ever mentioned it. I am not without my sense of mischief, however, and the temptation was quickly growing quite irresistible. <laughs> I asked Fuji what he had in mind, to which he shrugged. He hadn't put any forethought into it, but he was sure to be inspired the moment that we actually went over there. Damn it, you son of a bitch, count me in. <laughs> I got up off the couch and went to the den. The neckbeard nest, as it were. And indeed, the door was wide open, and Kurt snored loudly on the couch. A beer can was precariously cradled against his body as he sawed his stupefied logs, and Fuji and I did everything in our power not to snicker as we explored his apartment of our own free will. <laughs> Fuji, who had grabbed a sharpie, tastefully set about drawing dicks all over Kurt's face, while I went to explore the kitchen, I opened the fridge out of morbid curiosity. Well, Kurt must have gone shopping, because inside there sat a fresh bottle of maple syrup. And nothing else. <laughs> I grabbed the bottle from wherein and produced a napkin from the garbage that had only piled higher since I had last visited this kind abode. Something scuttled underneath, but I paid it no mind. Because today, taking out the trash was not my objective. At least, not in the literal sense, eh? <laughs> I liberally applied some syrup to the napkin and set to work, applying a lovingly sticky film to every drawer handle that I could find. <laughs> Subtle. Uh, when I came back into the living room, Fuji had stood back, admiring his masterpiece. Even Van Gogh would blush at the veiny impressionist rendition of phalluses upon this beard's face. <laughs> I smiled at Fuji and mouthed, Look what I found! And his eyes went wide with glee. He reached down to the end of the couch where Kurt had put his shoes and hat on the floor <laughs> and picked them up and then handed them to me, stifling his laughter. I did not have to be a psychic to know what it was that he was getting at, and so I applied a generous glob of maple syrup to the inside of each of these garments. <laughs> I, however, was not done and decided that there needed to be one final touch, 
the piece de resistance. I went to the bathroom and coated the top of the toilet seat <laughs> with more of that sweet, sticky syrup. <laughs> uh, oh, little did he know that his own refrigerator would be his undoing. With our work now finished, we left the Beard's apartment and waited for the inevitable sounds of profanity and crunching drywall while I settled in to play a bit more Skyrim. An hour must have passed before we heard a banging on our door. Who else could it be? <laughs> Fuji got up from the couch first before I did and opened the door to reveal a very haggard and angry Kurt. The veiny penis drawn on his face <laughs> flushed bright red from the blood in his cheeks. I choked back a laugh as Kurt launched into a tirade. <laughs> Kurt, or was it you? Were you in my fucking house? Why are my goddamn shoes sticky, Fuji? You son of a bitch. I'll knock your fucking teeth out. Wrong words. Fuji is another one of those guys who I would instantly throw down for, and threatening him is sure to get my attention. I got up off the couch like a bolt of lightning, bent towards an electrical tower, cleared the whole living room in seconds, and interposed myself between the two. I pushed Kurt off the threshold and out into the driveway, shoving him back every time he tried to step forward, insisting for him to do something. I let him vent for a while while he T-posed at me <laughs> to try and assert his dominance before I spit in his face, and he threw a punch that wouldn't even have hurt my aging grandmother. <laughs> Everybody gets one freebie. If you don't put me out cold, then what happens next is all on you. I wish I still had the five seconds of video that Fuji had taken. All you could hear was the limp-wristed whap of his fist on my face before I immediately perked up yelling, all right, let's fucking go then. And it cuts back to me pinning him against the stucco wall of the driveway with a handy one-two across the face and a full-weighted punch to the solar plexus, punctuated by a solid and loud Ugh! as the air vacated his body. <laughs> I think he did tell me about this fight that happened, Riptide. You should have sent me the video then. I would still have it. I guarantee it. It was a very satisfying feeling as I put him into a headlock and dragged him around by his neck across the gravel driveway as it shredded up his skin and clothes, all the while scolding him for daring to inconvenience my friends. <laughs> I don't think the dick on his face could have been any more blood engorged and red by the time I finally let him go after he was desperately tapping at my arm for me to stop. Ramtide and stay out. <laughs> it took Kurt a moment to get up from the ground before dusting himself off, wiping the blood from his lip, and choking through tears that I would live to regret laying hands on him. I told him, whatever kid, go home. To which he did, tail tucked between his legs. After the fact, I realized that I had just been in a brawl, barefoot, in a gravel driveway, and took some time to clean up what few wounds I had incurred as a result of my own wrath. When I got out of the shower, I went back downstairs, feeling good about myself when another knock on the door caught my attention. Aw, oh, crap. <laughs> I opened it to a police officer standing in my driveway, as would be expected, I guess, inquiring about the incident from not even an hour ago. I told him, so far, most of the story that had happened, the notes, the knife, that Kurt was not welcome in this house, and that he had come into our house despite all that, declaring ill intent. And the cop just shook his head. Cop, Yeah, well, he asked for a ride to the hospital to get checked out. I don't know if he wants to press charges or not, but in the meantime, just stay away from him. He had picked a fight and then cried to every authority figure he could conceive after he got his ass completely handed to him. <laughs> the paramedics, the police... I chuckled at the thought of catching a charge over beating him blue in a driveway before just shrugging it off. If he possessed even one ounce of self-awareness, he would avoid that course of action. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure he doesn't possess even one ounce. That's the standard for beards. 
And Ramtide agrees. While I had my doubts about his self-awareness, he was at least vested in his own self-interest, and God, unapologetically so, the legal route could turn out to be very ugly for him if he wanted to play that game, I'm used to myself, before once again shrugging it all off and settling in for a bit more Skyrim. The next two days, I felt like a hero. The word got around town that I had handled Kurt, and I enjoyed my 15 minutes of fame from even the most unlikely places. You see, Kurt had a bit of a reputation around town, as I found out, and basically nobody liked him. God, I'm shocked. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> I must have played that fight a million times over, to the amusement of my co-workers at the time, and I enjoyed several free beers, and even a couple of free dinners as the days went by, and even a few hugs and handshakes for a much-needed beating that polite society was too afraid to deliver. <laughs> it was not all well in paradise, however. After I had returned home one fateful evening, I came in, as usual, and grabbed a seat on the couch beside TJ while I undid my shoes. He was stoned to the bone, as I expected, but as he sputtered through his last hit, he motioned for me to not get up just yet and to go take a shower. I gave pause and examined the solemn, weed-choked glaze imposed on TJ's face. TJ, Bro, Kurt complained to the landlord about you the other day, man. She called and told me that everybody on the lease who doesn't actually live here has to go. Whoa. Sorry, man, but there's nothing I can do. I give you the weekend. Oh my god, but then you gotta go. With a heavy heart, I accepted the consequences of my actions and began placing calls. But nobody was in a position to receive me. <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> The next night, when I went to work, I told the tragedy of my story to the chef, and one of my co-workers took pity on my earned but unmerited plight and offered to rent me the room wherein I would live for the next two years. I seized upon this opportunity in a heartbeat, and within the next two days, I found myself lovingly settled into a comfy new abode and in good company. Well, it ain't as good as living rent-free, but... <laughs> It has to do for now. But I was not done, however. Oh no. A ramtide scorned is a dangerous thing. I went to work and came home, enjoying my video in my comfy new room that for once wasn't a living room, while I meditated upon what step I would take. It was not, however, these moments deep in pensive meditation that yielded how I would get the final straw but rather a moment of divine inspiration one evening as I was walking home. I had just finished up in the dish pit for the night and had found myself walking about the square, lost in my own little world, when a haggard meth muppet accosted me in the middle of my stride. Meth muppet? Hey man, you know where I can get some dope? I can understand why this question would be directed at me. <laughs> I've received questions like, Hey man, do you know where the parole office is? Or, are you holding? A lot. <laughs> it's the tattoos, Ramtide. Face tattoo? Yeah, you probably know where the parole office is. Sorry for anybody out there with face tattoos. It's just profiling, and it saves time. <laughs> and indeed, Ramtide admits, I very much look like someone beholden to that information. And while usually... I do not know where the parole office is located, or where one can find a bag of white. Tonight, I was feeling devious. <laughs> a light bulb went off in my head. Oh, dude. I'll see where this is going. Ramtide. Dude, I know where you can get the best dope in town. You know where those new apartments went up? Well, you go down that street right there up the gravel driveway at the end of the block and just knock on the door. Ask for Kurt. He's got some shit that'll blow your mind fresh up from Mexico and he is trying to move it quick. He's like almost always home and his door is usually unlocked too. You should tell your friends. If he asks who sent you, tell him Juan. <laughs> He'll know who you're talking about. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, the redheaded portly man child named Juan. <laughs> God, that kills me. Uh, oh, <laughs> Kurt's gonna get stabbed. <laughs> Meth Muppet. Sick, thanks, man. The creature departed into the dead of the night, off to go score his evening fix, and I chuckled at what I had set in motion, though the beautiful ramifications of it all would not become known to me for quite some time. And so we reach the epilogue. Though I could no longer live at that house, I still kept in touch with Fuji and TJ. As legend would have it, a great deal of homeless foot traffic started taking place in their neighborhood. <laughs> Most specifically, right in their driveway. When they enlightened me to these events, I feigned cluelessness, remarking that, yeah, the town just must be going downhill. <laughs> the meth was already bad. Why wouldn't it just get worse? However, Kurt seemed a lot more chipper with my presence gone. However, he was particularly at a loss to explain the increased amount of foot traffic to and from his house, despite the fact that he had begun to make money hand over fist from peddling dope. This was all well and good, however, until one morning, <laughs> the SWAT team materialized upon everybody's doorstep. Oh man, jail's probably worse than getting stabbed, honestly. <laughs> You knew this ride couldn't last forever. One of those junkies is going to roll over on you. God damn. Nothing but what he deserves, though. My former roommates were rudely awoken to a voice coming from a loudspeaker one morning, demanding that the tenant from Unit B exit his apartment with his hands in the air. It seems that somebody had taken notice of the increased midnight traffic to and from Kurt's abode and had decided to phone in that they suspected that something foul was afoot. <laughs> something foul. Kurt eventually found himself locked in a long and protracted legal battle, charged with possession and distribution of illicit substances. After some time, he eventually moved out. Probably couldn't afford that rent no more. Everybody wins. <laughs> After this incident occurred, TJ had received a call from the landlord regarding the recent event with the SWAT team right next door. TJ told me that he could sense a hint of grief in her voice. That perhaps, in the end of it all, she was wrong to request that I be the one removed from her property, instead of the nefarious neckbeard next door selling drugs to maintain his rapidly diminishing quality of life. <laughs> While TJ never did extend the offer to me to come back, I was no worse for the wear, honestly, happily occupying, for the first time in years, my very own room, replete with even a bed. A real bed of your very own, Ramtide. Moving up in the world, boy. Proud of you. I don't know what happened to Kurt. I like to think that he's become a permanent resident of the penal system, but I would be okay if he merely had to spend the next five years on probation with drug testing. Nobody in town mentioned anything about him to me since the day he moved away, however, so I assume that he is in fact gone for good. I know I'm not the only one in that town who joined in that collective cry of GOOD FUCKING RIDDANCE! <laughs> And therein concludes this particular tale of neckbeardery, dear friends. Take heart, because you are not alone in this world, and in a world wherein beards reside, my work of creating those sticky situations to crush their beardery from them still remains incomplete. If they will not learn, then they will learn. <laughs> and so it seems that it is my time to depart from you once again, but do not be sad, dear friends, for one day I shall return. There are only so many places where this vagabond can roam. Special thanks goes out to my lovely patrons for believing in me, supporting the work that I do, and who have been an absolute blessing during my travels through this uncertain and peculiar thing that we call existence. Specifically, Nat One Nick, Calvicus, Dayton Does, A&SB, <laughs> Fire Drake, DigiNZ, and Tato Ferret. My love and admiration, as always, to Red X and the greater Red X community. 
Hot damn, dude. And so another series comes to an end. We're going to miss Ramtide until he uh, finds his way back to civilization. <laughs> I did predict that this whole thing would end with a fight, but that wasn't really a fight. It was just like a physical altercation, a neckbeard getting his ass kicked. And honestly, you do love to see it. <laughs> getting dragged around the gravel driveway. Oh. I would pay good money for that video, Ramtide. If you find it, let me know. We'll get it up on the channel at some point. And while the physical altercation is entertaining, it's not as entertaining as what happens next. He goes and cries, Mommy, Mommy, to the police. <laughs> Tries to get Ramtide evicted. I mean, he does succeed, but then Ramtide sets like one little pebble into motion that just causes his whole life to fall into a landslide. But that's largely because of his own hubris, isn't it? Like, you got strangers showing up on your doorstep like, Hey, I want to buy some dope, and you don't vet anybody? Of course you're going to get caught. What the fuck? <laughs> Just a matter of time, bro. Every dealer that I ever had only lasted as long as they did because they didn't work with anybody that wouldn't have somebody else vouch for them. You know what I mean? If you got some street junkie rolling up to your doorstep and be like, hey, let me buy something. Like, dude, I don't know you. Whatever you got, 5, 10, 20 bucks, take it away. I don't want it because it's going to cost me years in jail. Probably. Like Ramtide said, we don't actually know what happened to him. But I do know that Arizona has, like, pretty harsh drug sentencing laws. So I would be willing to bet that Kurt did at least a little bit of time. And you know those inmates had a good old time with them in there. <laughs> no more fallout pen and paper for this guy. The only fallout that that neckbeard will get to experience anytime soon is his rectum falling out. <laughs> oh, God. And of course, I'm also glad to see Ramtide, you know, stepping up in the world, making moves, doing big things. I always knew that he would because... He is just, like, insanely talented. So I know that will continue, and he will indeed find his way to success of the highest order. And if you guys would like to help me reach success of the highest order, <laughs> I hope that you'll like, comment, and or subscribe on the video if you did enjoy it. Maybe share it around, or you can wait for the whole saga and, like, share the, ho the whole big beefy thing around. That would be cool, too, you know? I also hope you check out the links in the description. There's all kinds of stuff going on down there. Mine and my wife's channel, Mr. and Mrs. Red X. There is some new content up there. I hope you'll go check it out. We got the Teespring if you're trying to rock the merch. My personal subreddit, r slash Red X Reads. And, of course, my Amazon affiliate link. If you click on through there, buy anything on Amazon, I get kicked back a small percentage, which is pretty cool. You know, if you were going to buy something anyways, it's like a win-win. We've also got my social medias, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, oh, and my gorgeous, wonderful, beautiful, generous patrons, of course. So I'd like to thank them as I do every video. Thank you very much. Calvicus, Fatboy Shrimp, Robert Waits, TSM Kirby, Aaron W, Delicious Jelly Donut, Candy Sora, Fire Drake, Livison, Mr. Anime Manga Fan, Silent Revolver, Zero MMX, Magdalene Marshall Thornrose, Little Lone Wolf, Vanilla Mel, Ralph Stower, Babsy Coon, Caustic Fox, Disposable Waifu, Aaron Lennox, Fisher Diggy, Heathcliff, OG James Cook, a pimp named Jabe Crisp, JM Coon, Jerry, John Hero, Miss Monday, Melgar the Destroyer, Mirthful Baker, my boy Natwood Nick, Lady Nick's Orgamy Steve, Kate against Elizabeth, Sidestep, Cider Drinker, Serrated Ash, Siegfried, Synaptic Boomstick, Tamago, Tato Ferret, Teddy the Police, Ten Ton Monster, Dead Duck and Bug, Fusky, Treeberg, Will Mags, Red Wind, Goose says Honk, Leon Embers, Naga Viper, John Indoors, A Normal Joe, A Roxers, Cake Jerry, that's a different Jerry. <laughs> KJW, Kajow, Little Ann Woods, Mark211, maybe next time, Milk Fed Gimp, Miss Duchess, Orgamic Cam, Princess Rosalie, Raptor Art, Ellie, The Last Shinobi, and the Maestro himself, Zuka Serfantes. Thank you guys very, very much for supporting the channel in the way that you do. It means the world to me. I do hope some other folks will consider joining up, but if you can't do it right now, don't sweat it too hard, friends. I just appreciate you coming on through. Hanging out with me, and I hope that you come on back and hang out with me again tomorrow. In order to do so, you need to keep yourself safe out there. Wash your hands, but also take some time out and do something that you personally enjoy today. Maybe, um, watching some more Red X videos. Always remember, friends, that you are loved, you are worthy, and you definitely, definitely deserve it. I shall see you in the next one. 
And until then, friends, bye-bye.